Hi everyone, I forgot to unmute myself, so that's probably why you can't hear me. Um, can you hear me now? And can you um, can you see things? I have unmuted myself, which is the first thing you should do. Um, obviously, I've gone off the rails as well. If you can hear my voice is a bit hoarse, I'm sorry in advance. Okay, all right, let's let's get going. Sorry, again, we're running a bit late because uh, just, uh, just sometimes you just want to pick up the whole computer and throw it out the window. So um, if at any stage you see me getting angry, that's probably what's going to happen and my computer's right next to a window. So it's absolutely going out the window. No, it's not. It's not really going out the window, but it should go out the window sometimes. Um, I hope everyone is... Uh, doing great and I hope everyone has enjoyed some freedoms uh, over the if you are in New South Wales we had this exciting um, exit out of well some freedoms are allowed so that that's been a bit exciting um, I got to go to a dog park that I haven't been able to enter for a very long time so that was super exciting <laughs> maybe not for anyone else but I was very excited um, and my dogs do love that park um, okay, Okay. so let's, um, let's get going. Lecture 9, we are halfway through the term. Can you guys believe it? It's been, what a term, um, what a whirlwind. And it's been all completely um, in a bit of a lockdown situation, so you had nothing else to do except for um, doing some coding, but now in these next five weeks, you might actually have uh, a lot of things to do. Um, so please try and find still time to do some programming um, and to hopefully keep up with what we're doing here because uh, we're going to, you know, we're getting sort of into the much harder stuff now and um, things are going to, you know, increase in difficulty. But if you keep going and if you keep practicing, you will be okay. And I hope that um, I hope that you are able to uh, also enjoy the next part of the course as well. All right, so let's let's get going. Okay, um, let's. Last week we talked about uh, a little bit about libraries, but today we're gonna and this week we're gonna learn a lot more uh, about certain functions that are available to us that are pretty helpful. So uh, you know that will be great. We learned about one D arrays and looked at two dimensional arrays, um, which allowed us to make a grid. We talked about how your assignment is also very much all about a two dimensional array. So it's got a little grid grid a little field where you know the farmers moving around so that's pretty exciting and then we got introduced to pointers um, and when we got introduced to pointers pretty sure everyone started hating me um, but that's that's okay we're gonna do more pointers because pointers are pretty exciting um, so uh, yeah I can see lots of people discussing haircuts as well um, I tried my appointments on the 9th of December to get a haircut so that's that's going to be a long way away um, all right, back to pointers. Today we're revisiting pointers. I'm going to go through them quickly again so that you get to um, have a little bit more of an idea of what a pointer is. And as I said in my weekly message, uh, you know, often pointers are quite a hard concept to grasp because it's the first time you've been introduced to something that in any way resembles this type of concept. But do not worry, it will, it will come through. Um, and it will start to make sense. You really need to see pointers a few times and you need to use them yourself a few times. And I believe you really need to drop a diagram to see, you know, what's actually happening, uh, you know, for the first few times you use pointers anyway, because it really helps you to get a good idea of what's going on, okay, and of how to actually, you know, bring it all together, which is what we're going to try and do for the next few weeks. Well, not in week six. In week six, you guys get to have a break, uh, which is also super exciting. All right, we're going to look at some good debugging today as well. 
We're going to look at what our compile time errors and what our runtime errors. Um, so that's going to be something that we will, and, and sort of in more detail, how do I debug this code? Because I've seen, you know, a few of you asking questions on the forums and stuff. What does this error mean and what does this error mean? There are definitely a lot of errors, uh, you know, that you can get and a lot of different meanings. So we'll talk about trying to find out what um, sort of what the things actually mean and where they're occurring. And hopefully today we'll also have time to learn two new functions uh, that are available to us with our characters and they're getchar and putchar. Um, and they're just they're just functions that we'll be borrowing, um, you know, from the library. They're not really anything that we need to write, but we're just going to learn how they can help us when we're doing some programming. So any function that we borrow is really the purpose of it is to help us, um, you know, help us not write our own code. It, we're using someone else's code that's already been written that we know uh, works as we need to. All right, uh, our live lecture link is not working either for some reason. I'm really sorry. Um, we are going to fix it in the break, um, but uh, meanwhile, um, this is where it's going to be. Uh, but meanwhile, I'll try and keep it a little bit simple and then the code will appear where you want it to appear, um, hopefully uh, by the middle of the class. All right, so I wanted to, I wanted to quickly go over what a pointer is. Okay, and the reason I want to do that is to give you a little bit of a nice overview so that you are able to uh, keep up with what we're going to do now. Because guess what? We're going to do some pointers. Okay, so let's, let's do this whole thing where we're doing an exciting um, pointer. So if you remember, we had uh, something called, uh, I, I had a variable called int box. And I made that equal to six. Now everyone gets to see how terribly I write because I'm sharing the wrong screen. Okay, and so let's say that's equal to six. Okay, so we'll have a box which is our variable box and inside this box I'm going to place this number six okay and this box as everything in the computer it has to have somewhere to live so it's going to have a memory address you'll notice that I start all memory addresses with a zero and an X okay and what that means is it's a hexadecimal number and it's just a base 16 number which is often how memory addresses are and I'm going to make it this random address, I've just literally made it up, okay? It doesn't mean anything. So let's say I've got this lovely uh, variable called box. So this is my box. It's of type int. It's got the six in it, and this is the address of it. Okay, now let's say I have a pointer, okay? So let's say I've declared a pointer, and I want that pointer to point to my box, okay? I'm going to call it box pointer. And you don't have to call it that. You would have noticed that I often call it uh, with an under dash. I'll have the PTR after it if it's a pointer. Um, one of the places I used to work at uh, used to do their pointers like that always. Um, and I've become quite used to labeling my pointers with a PTR. You absolutely do not have to do it. You can call your pointers whatever you want. Remember, this is just a variable name. And so if you remember, the pointer, so now I've created a pointer, the pointer itself is a variable also, okay? So what it means is this variable has an address as well somewhere in memory, okay? So it's got whatever address, uh, let's say F32, okay? So it's got its own address, but what I'm going to do is a pointer stores the address of another variable that it points to. And the way we do that is we say it with ampersand, which means address off. So what that means is if this is my box pointer here, inside it, I'm storing the address of this variable. So I've pointed it at the address of that variable. So that means inside this pointer, I'm going to actually store the address.
So what that means now is if I dereference this pointer, so if I say, okay, I'm going to dereference this box pointer, which you do with a star, and if I say, what is this equal to, my dereference of my box pointer? What it does is it goes inside this box pointer, okay? It goes into my variable, which has this address in it, okay? But I'm not asking for the address, because if I was asking for the address, I would just have this. When I have the star, what I'm saying to you is go to whatever this address is. So what it does is it goes to this address and retrieves what's sitting in there. So whenever there is a star, that means it means go to the address that's stored in this variable and get me what is at that address, okay? So uh, basically, a pointer is a variable that stores an address of another variable in it, okay? And uh, pointers are very useful in functions, okay? Because you might have noticed that you can only return one thing when you do your functions. You can return either an int or you can return either a char and you have to kind of decide what you're going to return to start off with. So you can already kind of maybe see that pointers would be very useful because you can change things directly at the memory address, okay? Which means you don't have to return things. You are changing them exactly already at the source, which means that you're able to change more than one thing or more than two things and so on and so forth. So the next question that we're going to do is going to be a little bit of code, but what I want to do is I want to actually solve it in a number of different ways. And the first way we're going to solve it is without a pointer, but then I'm going to talk about why perhaps it is useful to use pointers to solve it um, as well. Okay, so let me go on. And I can see Alvin is answering your questions. So that is uh, quite exciting. So if you have any more questions, just let me know. Okay, our problem. What we're going to do is we're going to uh, read in an array of numbers um, and the user will specify how many numbers they plan to read in. And we'll talk about that as well, why we do that, why we need to know how many things there are. And then the first number and the last number of that array will be swapped and the modifier array will be printed out again. So, um, it's not, um, sorry, you can't see the lecture code, but uh, I will make it obvious now. So the lecture code that you should have been able to see and that I thought that you've been seeing for 24 hours, but you haven't been, is this. But hopefully we'll fix it for you in the half time. So, this function, okay, it's a program that takes in an array of a given length and swaps the first and the last elements of that array. So this is going to let us practice using our arrays again, uh, one-dimensional arrays. It's also going to let us practice using functions and it's also going to let us practice using, uh, you know, using pointers. And then we'll talk about why perhaps you would use pointers at all. <coughs> Okay, so let's have a look. So someone summed it up really nicely in the chat. Yeah, a pointer has its own address and it stores the address of a variable and then you can access the variable in that address if you use the star, it means you want to dereference. So you want to open up what's at the address that you're storing in your variable. If you call your pointer without the star, what it means is just give me what is stored inside that variable, which is going to be the address, okay, which is a little bit useless to you because there's not much you can do, um, there's not really much you can do with an address. Okay, and also I just want to say pointers uh, can be uh, dangerous things, okay, so we are easing you into pointers. So we're going to be doing a lot more pointers and you're going to see a lot more use to pointers as well after the flexibility week. But pointers can be quite dangerous things because we are accessing memory and we are changing things directly in memory. So if you imagine what, you know, 1,000, 2,000 lines of code, a few pointers going in there, who knows what anyone is doing kind of thing sometimes, sometimes. So it can be quite dangerous in that uh, you're, you're writing directly to the source and you're accessing different things. So it can get very messy, okay? Um, which is why we want to ease you into it and kind of introduce pointers slowly so that you get um, a good idea of how to do it, you know, of how not to hopefully cause any issues. 
Um, someone's asked if we're going to be covering memory leaks. We will. Uh, we will touch on memory leaks absolutely, and we will touch on um, yeah, leaking leaky memory. We will, um, which is always so much fun. Not, but it gives you a very good idea of what happens inside the computer. Okay, so let's read in an array. Um, and then we're going to read in numbers, user specifies how many numbers they will enter, user then provides the numbers, print out the original array, swap the first and the last number in that array and print out the modified array. Okay, so what I've done is in the main, and this is the code that you should have been able to see, I'm so sorry that you cannot see it. Um, in the main, I've actually written out exactly what happens. And this is an example of how to use um, functions as well, because what I've done is I've created an array, I've created the size of the array, and then I called a function that will read it in, okay? And then what I've done is I printed out the original array, um, and I called a function print, I called a function swap, and then I called the function print again, okay? So what I'm doing is basically I'm breaking up my problem just as, as I've broken it up before, um, and I'm going to use functions to implement to implement the whole thing. So it's going to be able to, you know, break down the problem completely. And it's not to say that you can't do some of these things inside the main function. You absolutely can. For example, here I'm reading the size of the array in a function. I've, I've sort of earmarked it that I'll do it in a function, but you don't have to. You can read it inside the main as well. Okay, so it depends how you're going to structure your program and what you are going to actually you know, end up with. So we use the functions to make our programs easier to read. So you need to be able to decide whether you moving something to a function is going to make it easier or harder. As well, if there's any code that repeats all the time, you want to have that in a function because you can just call the function all the time. So for example, I've printed an array here twice. So writing a function is a no-brainer because it's much easier to call a function as opposed to actually doing a print through an array each and every time. Um, I can see that you guys are having some buffering. It should stop now. I've just had it come up with excellent conditions. So hopefully what it means is that it will stop buffering and it will um, be a smooth uh, internet movement now. <coughs> Okay, so let's let's do it. Okay, uh, let's do it without. Let's try and write some functions. Okay. Okay, so I've declared an array, and I it is very good practice to give your declaration of an array. It's very good practice to give it a sort of a maximum size that it can have. So I've hash defined maximum size a hundred. If you remember when we compile an array, will um, be created based on what we've declared. So memory will be allocated for this array for 100 ints inside this array. Okay, no matter if I use only three of them, no matter if I use only two elements, there's going to be 100 spots of memory for ints available to me. Okay, so as you can see already, this is probably not that efficient because I'm always guessing how many spots I will need or how big an array I need to make, you know. And often you'll see much bigger numbers than 100. You'll see 1,000 or, you know, uh, 1,024. So it's a multiple of, you know, two. But so what happens is that I end up wasting some space when I create arrays because memory is allocated for an array. Uh, when you compile your program, when you begin running it, you cannot change it, okay? So memory is already allocated to it. All right, so now let's read in. Um, let's read in our size of the of, of an array. Okay, let's do that. So let's do this function here: int uh, read size, and we're going to return the size of our array. Oh, sorry. Okay. Ah. Terrible spelling. Okay, so who has an idea of what we're going to do? Let's let's load up the array in here as well. So who has uh, thoughts of what we're going to do? Who has ideas? Okay. 
So has anyone got any ideas of how we get the size of the array? I mean, we really can't, we kind of can't, we need to be able to ask the user how many numbers they're going to put into this array before they start. So a good place to start would be asking the user, how many things do you want? Yep. And then we use an index to actually keep count of how many things were entered and what's going on. And yep, like Lisa said, by using the scanf as well. Okay, uh, so how many numbers do you want to enter? <clears throat> yep, and use while to scan F through. Absolutely, that sounds really good to me. Okay, so let's say how many numbers would you like to enter? And then we're going to let them scan in some numbers. Now, we want to really, we want to be able to keep track of how many numbers they are scanning in. Um, and so uh, basically, let's have a variable, I don't know, let's count how many things they're going to, they're going to give us. So I'm going to count, I'm going to have a counter and I'm going to set it to zero to start with. Okay, and then let's scan how many numbers they're going to So we'll scan in a percent D and we're going to place it inside the counter. So this will tell us how many numbers they're going to scan in, okay? And what it means is that now we can run a while loop, okay? And the while loop will allow us um, to go from zero until, uh, actually, it's going to go from zero until this counter, we're going to be scanning in the different array elements. So the reason that we need to know this is because we need to know where to stop our while loop when, we, when we're filling up the array. So I'll have an index that will keep track and then I'm going to have a while loop. So whilst I is less than the counter, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask them to enter some sort of uh, number to put into their array. Okay, and then I'm going to scan it in. Okay, and now where am I scanning it into? Who who knows where will I scan it into? So I want to keep them into my array. What will I scan it into? If you notice in the main, I've got this int array max size. And when I call my read size function, I call it with array. So I call it with the name of the array. And remember when we send the array over, it's going to, what it's going to do is it's going to give us um, it's going to give us like the memory address for the for the very first element in that array. Yep, so well done guys. So array I, yep. And because we're scanning into the memory address, I'm going to use the ampersand symbol. So I'm going to pop it into array at index I. Um, well done. And then I'm going to increase my index because otherwise I'm going to get stuck in an infinite loop. And at the end of it, I'm going to return not a zero because a zero will say nothing to me. If I return zero, uh, I'm returning uh, the size of zero, okay, which I don't really want to do. I actually want to return how many elements there are in that array, okay? So I'm going to return the counter because that's what's telling me how many things there are in my array. So now I have the size of my array because when I finish this function, the number that is going to be returned to me is going to go into the variable size. Okay, then I'm looking to print out the original array and I'm going to print it out by using the array function and the size. So this is why I always need to know the size because otherwise uh, if I don't have the size of an array when I move it around functions, um, it's very hard to... Uh, remember if we move an array, it moves the memory address of the zero index but unless I have the size of the array and I give it to a function as well I'm not going to be able to know when on earth to stop okay because that that information doesn't get passed on so I need to know how big my array is when I pass it on to a function 
Okay, so now here I've got two arrays being swapped by pointers, okay? The reason I know that this function is using pointers is because I'm sending it um, memory addresses, yeah? I'm using the ampersand symbols to send in memory addresses. So there is really two ways to do it. I don't have to do it with pointers, okay? But the reason I it's very handy to do it with pointers is because swapping elements is a pretty common function. So in this case, in this question, I'm swapping the first element and the last element. I can easily do that without using pointers, right? But if I have to start swapping any other elements or if I have to, if I want to be able to change what I'm swapping, that's going to become more and more pieces of code um, that are all really performing the same function, which is swapping. So it's something that's good to move out to a function if you're going to be doing swapping all the time. Um, and that means that you can use the swap function and you can call it any elements of the array to swap. It doesn't always have to be the first or the last, depending on what you're doing. Now, swapping is a really common problem in computer science, okay? There are many ways to swap, um, and swapping is like a really sort of fun way to, to move things around, I guess. So, has anyone ever swapped anything in, in computing? So a good analogy for it is, uh, let's say you have a glass of milk and you have a glass of orange juice and you want to pour the orange juice into the cup of milk and the milk into the orange juice. How will you do it? <laughs> so lots of, someone said they've swapped their soul okay for this course ah uh, yes my stream's just frozen it did freeze for a second i'm sorry it's because the weather is bad as well I think I think you're good to go now. Seems really mine still says no data. Now it's back. Okay, I think I'm back. Okay. Um, Alvin, how is my stream? Yep, I believe you're good. Okay, excellent. Um, okay, so a lot of people are saying, yep, get another cup, you need a third glass. I mean, honestly, I think I need many glasses after this technological apocalypse that is consistently happening to my internet. Um, yep. So, uh, well done guys, you need a third glass because you need to be able to pour something into something before you can swap the other glasses. So, um, uh, let's, let's, let's actually implement it. So, the function here uses pointers, okay? Um, so, I've got, I'm sending it a pointer, two int pointers, uh, pointer one and pointer two. Oh, my condition is now excellent. My connection is now excellent. So, it should really not be blurry in about five seconds because there's a lag. So uh, things should really uh, get better in about a second. Okay, so let's have a look. Um, 
someone, uh, Tim's got a really great idea, throw the liquid up into the air, quickly catch with opposite cups, karate sound effects are required, fantastic. Um, that sounds actually like a really good way to do it, I like that. Um, I'm not going to be throwing anything because otherwise I'll throw the glasses up in the air uh, and it's all going to break uh, and milk and orange juice are going to go everywhere. So uh, if I'm swapping, as you guys have said, I will need a third glass. Um, people are saying they can't see, but my stream says it's excellent. Uh, you should be able to see now. Should be good. Reload your screen if it's still blurry. Okay, so Adith is asking what cups. I mean, we've just, it's 10, 10.40. We've all really started drinking I think uh, it's been a long day um, so basically when we swap numbers I've made an analogy of imagine if you have a cup of milk and a cup of um, orange juice okay and you want to be able to swap those two around so there's no way that you can really do it without having a third glass okay and once you have a third glass then you can easily kind of you know be able to swap things around um, so that's where the cups are coming from and the glasses. Uh, don't worry, no one's doing any morning morning time. Um, so usually when we have this third glass or third cup that we're just keeping for, you know, only, you know, a few seconds, we don't really care much about it. We usually call it a temp um, because it's a temporary variable. So I'm going to have an int temp and inside that int temp, I'm going to store my first the first element of the array okay so now if you notice when I sent the stuff to my function I gave the memory address of my first element now that memory address is stored in the pointer called number one pointer okay so that means that inside my temporary and remember that my temporary is of type int okay you might feel that maybe I'm going to put the number one pointer in here, okay? But this is not correct because remember that inside this number one pointer is a memory address, okay? So what you've just done is you've stored a memory address and you're trying to put it inside an integer pointer. So the only way you can do it is to dereference it, okay? So put the star on there as well because when you put the star, it means you're accessing what is at this memory address. So you've actually accessed what is at the first element of the array and you've popped it inside the integer temp, so the temporary integer variable. Okay, so now that means I can swap a few other things around. So now I can swap my number one with my number two. And again, I've forgotten my dereference. Otherwise, I'm um, apples and oranges. I want to be comparing the same things. And now it's time for me to use my uh, temporary storage. So inside into number two, I'm going to place whatever was in number one, which is currently stored in my temp. Now you'll notice that this function is of type void. And the reason for that is, is that I'm making all the swaps using pointers, which means that I'm making all the swaps inside actual memory addresses. So I don't actually need to return anything. Everything is going great. Okay, and now finally, I really want to be able to do some printing. Okay, so let's do some printing. And you have seen the printing function to print through a variable um, array. You've seen that quite a few times now. So you should be absolute pros at doing the print. So when you do the print, you've got your integer index. You set it to zero, which is the first element of the array. And then you have a while loop that will move through. So Whilst i is less than the size of this array, which is another variable that I've passed into this function, I'm going to print out whatever was in that array. So I'm going to print f a percent d, um, and I'm going to print out uh, from the array. So my array at index i. And you don't you don't have to use pointers for this swap function okay it doesn't absolutely have to be pointers so what happens is uh, you're using pointers because what you're doing is you're making it really easy to swap anything in advance 
So someone's a bit confused. So let's do, for example, okay, my array is one, two, three, four, five, okay? That's the example array. So what I've sent over here is I've sent it the first element. So I've sent it the address of the first element and the address of the last element. So, <clears throat> so I've sent it a one and a five, okay? What that means here is my temporary is going to be equal to whatever it is at the address of the first one. So that means that this is going to be equal to one, okay? Then on this next line, I dereferenced my, uh, whatever is stored in here, okay? So when I dereference this, I'm going to place it and I'm going to place whatever is in the dereference number two pointer, okay, in there. Remember, we always do the right side first and then we do the left side, okay? So what was inside the second one? Inside the second one was the number five. So what I want to say is I want this pointer now to equal to five. So whatever is sitting at this address, I actually want it to equal to five now, okay? And now that means that on this line, what I've done is I've said the second one now. So whatever is sitting at this address, I wanted it to equal to the number that was inside temp, which is one, okay? So that means address at pointer one, and this one is address at pointer two. So what I've done is I've swapped them around. Okay, and then let's, uh, I think I've printed that out, and then what I'll do here is I'll print a new line just so that it looks nice. Okay, should we try it out? Let's run it. Let's try it out. Let's run. Oh. I just called it the shuffle. Oh well. Let's run the shuffle. How many numbers? Let's do five numbers. One, two, three, four, five. And it'll say the original array is one, two, three, four, five. The array with the first and last number swapped is five, two, three, four, one. So at a th absolutely, you do not have to use pointers for this. The reason I've done it is because if I were to do it without pointers, okay, if I was to move things around and swap the first and the last element of the array, absolutely fine. It will work perfectly. But look what I can do here. If I decide my problem has now changed and my problem is now to swap, I don't know, the second and the last element of the array, I can do that easily by just sending it different addresses. Okay. So what that means is that I've got a function that will be able to really help me out with a whole bunch of problems. And that means that I can reuse this function across a whole bunch of problems as well. Okay, so uh, that will sort of make a real difference in how you're writing these types of functions. So remember that for every problem, there is actually more than one solution. And there might be, you know, more, more than one uh, sort of more than one efficient solution as well. We don't always send we don't always uh, solve things in exactly the same way. We don't think in exactly the same way. That doesn't mean that your solution is not good. The reason I've solved it in this particular way here is to give you an example of how to use all the different things to bring them together. Okay. Um, now arrays are already sent by reference. That's right. What that means is that an array is changed anyway in a function. But what it allows me to do, if these numbers were not in an array, then I would be able to do it easily as well. So if it was not an array, if I was just reading in five numbers, had to swap the first and the last number that I was reading, I could do that easily as well because I can't return to things from a function, but I can certainly do things in the pointers. So I've used an array because an array is, you know, an easiest way to store a collection of numbers. But the demonstration aspect is there how to swap two things using pointers. So really, the point is that we will start solving more and more problems that lend themselves to using just pointers um, in the next few weeks. So don't worry, it's coming. 
but it's much easier to introduce pointers with very simple problems like swapping two numbers. And swapping two numbers is one of the simplest um, pointer exercises that you kind of do. Okay, so um, that was exciting and that took, because of all the problems that we had with technology, that took a little bit longer than everything that I had. Um, and someone's asked, would their dress of temp be different from the... Yes, absolutely. Their dress of temp, once I create a variable, that variable has an address, so they would be quite different uh, as well. <coughs> okay, let's, um, let's go for... Let's, let's do a two-minute break, and we'll come back if two minutes, maybe three minutes, just so you have time if you need to go to the bathroom. Um, let's have a three-minute break, a quick break, and then we will return, and we will do a few other things um, that will hopefully be fun. I'll stay so I can answer questions in the chat as well. So let's have a three-minute break, uh, and then we will continue after that. Uh, might as well. Are you no, muted? I'm not muted yet. Hold on. All right, so there's some really good questions in the chat. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give you just a little brief like finisher for this, not a finisher, no, because we're going to still keep doing pointers and stuff, but just a little brief overview as well. So the, oh, I'm amazed. Great questions. Okay, so 
I think some of you are also confused because we have this defined constant for an array at the top and the defined constant is 100 and then we're also counting things as well with an array. So it seems very confusing, counterintuitive. So what, what is happening is that when we declare an array, okay, we have to say what size that array is because memory for an array is given to us at compile time. So we can't, during runtime, when we populate the array or when we scan in and we say, we want five elements in this array, memory cannot be allocated to it then. It has to be allocated at compile time, which is why we give our array kind of like a value. And usually it's a large value so that hopefully it has enough space to store everything that we need to store. And often we won't use the whole of the array that we, that we have decided to kind of safe keep and ask memory for. But sometimes we will use more than that as well, which is a big problem if we try and use more because we're going to run out of space and it's quite difficult to give more space for an array. And I'll touch on that when we talk more about memory uh, after the flexibility week. So the reason there's that hash defined to start with is because we need to tell C how big, how much memory space to reserve for this array. And if we don't use up that whole memory space, that's okay too because we fill up however much we count. We use a counter to count how many things there are in that array. So that actually tells us how many actual things there are in this array. So there's not going to be a hundred in our case, but there might be, you know, five. Um, is it possible to give an array an infinite value? Um, you would probably crash um, the computer because you can't, you can't store an infinite amount of numbers. Remember that our integers have limits as well um, and they're based on memory size and everything else underneath. So you're, you can't have an infinite value. You can have the upper integer value of the most possible, you know, storage. But, you know, if you do that, you're using up a lot of memory potentially for no reason at all. Um, so remember that when it runs, it will safe keep that amount of memory that you've asked for. So the bigger that chunk is, the more memory you're potentially wasting. But it all depends on the problem as well, because you can see how many things you might read in or you might have a feel, you know, that the maximum would be a thousand or two thousand or so on and so forth. So that's that's part of it. Right. Um, and then. Um, uh, and then someone's asked also, uh, I think Zach is asking, are pointers the only way to feed the data from a variable in the main to a separate function? Absolutely not. You've seen us send just basic ints. You've seen us send basic chars. We can, you've seen us send arrays. So there's a whole bunch of things that we can do it with. We can, pointers is just another variable type that is available to us to feed data in. Now pointers are particularly useful in functions because a function can't return two things, okay? It's not, it's not possible. So if we need to change two things and we can't return two things, uh, if we're just sending basic variables, that's going to cause a real problem, okay? Because actually say what you've changed. And in that case, a pointer is quite useful because you've actually made the change at the source then. So you haven't, you, you don't need to return anything. You don't need to return that change because you've already changed it at the source, at the memory address. Okay. So you don't need to return something and place it in. I hope that has answered a few of those questions. Please just pop in the chat if you have any more. Um, these are really fantastic questions. I'm really pleased that you guys are thinking and asking these types of questions. Remember, um, these are great questions. They're not, uh, you know, they're not, they're really how everything is, is comes together in C as well. I should be good. Okay. Someone's asked, uh, how far, uh, someone, it's funny the the context, someone's asked how far would an infinite loop go for, and then someone's asked that I'm buffering again. Um, I'm clearly having a good day with my while loops. Um, well, I'm buffering. Um, please uh, refresh. I am having uh, poor stream health right now, but hopefully it will improve. Alvin's saying it's improved already, so that's good news. Um, how far will an infinite loop go? It depends, okay? It depends what you're doing inside that infinite loop, okay? If you are creating variables inside your infinite loop, uh, you might crash faster because you're using up memory every time you create a variable. 
Um, so it depends. It depends what you guys are doing as well. Um, you, you know, uh, my computer, as you've seen, an infinite loop uh, basically crashed everything, um, and uh, hopefully yours will not. Um, when will the lecture code be up? Uh, the lecture code will be up very soon. I'm really sorry um, that it is not up yet. Uh, Tom changed the simulation link and I don't know what he's changed it to to upload my lecture file and I've still put it on the old links. So we will fix that. Um, we will fix that ASAP. ASAP. Oh, I'm struggling to say ASAP now. Okay, uh, so keep popping your questions in chat. They're fantastic questions and they kind of really, they open the doors for a lot of really fascinating discussion, but also they kind of give you a really good solid understanding with what's going on as well. So I'm, I'm really happy with the kinds of questions you're asking. And if you, you know, have thought a little bit about what we've done in the lecture and you have more questions, just pop them in the forum um, and we will answer them in the forum as well. Okay, let's talk about bugs. I mean, fascinating. I think uh, uh, bugs are, oh, yeah, bugs are hard work. You guys would have been, uh, you know, you guys would have seen what a bug is now. You've done all your labs. You've done the assignments. So you would have encountered these issues that we call bugs. So bugs have been used, the term bugs has been used for ages, okay, as, as a problem in something that works. Um, and in about 1947, it started to be used in... Um, computer lingo as well. I think uh, the first sort of uh, use of the term bug was actually because it was a real moth. There was a computer, um, it was uh, in a team that Grace Hopper was a part of um, and basically uh, a moth got stuck in the machine and uh, as you can see this is an actual, the actual moth that got stuck. They sticky taped it onto the page, onto the diary um, and said, okay, that's actually caused huge problems. It was causing completely computational problems. And that's kind of where this whole, whole computer bug was born. It was from this lovely moth that got stuck in the back of the machine and was causing some serious problems as well. If you are interested in reading more about it, um, please feel free. I've given a, a link here. Um, it gives a little bit of background on how that has occurred. Um, but basically then we started using the word computer bugs. And when we removed that bug, so when they removed this actual moth that got stuck in the machine and was causing some electronic circuits to go crazy, um, they called it a debug. Yeah, so they removed the bug, they've debugged. Um, and so that's where the term debug comes from as well. So any error that stops your code from working as specified, we refer to it as a bug. And you can have two types of bugs, okay? Bugs that happen at compile time. Um, those are syntax issues. Those are the ones that you would have seen when you run DCC and it starts yelling at you. Usually those bugs are actually much easier to fix um, because you know you, you know that somewhere your syntax is slightly off so they're easier to find and fix. But then you have these runtime bugs when everything compiles perfectly but when you start running your program things do not work perfectly. And those are usually issues with your logic. And logic is very difficult. Well, it's not very, I mean, it's much harder to fix. You know, imagine thousands of lines of code um, and logic issues become much harder to fix uh, because you have to find where this one little um, throw to your logic uh, is happening. You know, perhaps you didn't understand the, the question and you were not uh, solving it properly uh, or perhaps uh, you... Um, um, perhaps, you know, you kind of, as we saw as well when we were doing our indexing, you know, perhaps you made it equal to the index that doesn't exist instead of just less than or greater than. Uh, and so that's thrown it off. And then with pointers, you might have, you know, be accessing an address that doesn't exist at all, which means you're accessing, um, you know, just an empty space. Um, there's nothing there. There's no such memory address. So you can't actually dereference that because there's nothing stored in it. So it's very you know, it becomes very difficult to spot these types of mistakes. And uh, Sienna is correct. It's very hard to see your own mistakes. Often you will be staring at the computer for hours. Something is super obvious, but you will not be able to see it. Um, and what I will tell you to do is if you've been sitting there and you cannot find your bug, go and do something else. Take a break, okay? Because the longer you stare at it, the harder it becomes to find. So, um, please, 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 you know, take a break from the computer um, and, you know, often you'll come back and you'll spot it really quickly. 
Um, there have been moments where, you know, you kind of try and go to sleep as well and you can't sleep because all you can think about is where is this bug occurring? I have to find it. I have to think through, you know, I've had moments at 3 a.m. when I've just sort of gone, oh, I think I know where it is. And then I'll get out, you know, go to my computer, fix what I think it is, and it's not going to be that. So back to square one. Um, so bugs, bugs definitely keep us entertained. Um, well, ent entertained, um, but they're very frustrating. So debugging, you guys have probably already spent quite a bit of time writing code, uh, even more time troubleshooting what you've written. Uh, welcome to debugging. It is uh, super fun. Well, sometimes super fun. It's not like, sometimes it's really not fun. It's more fun to debug someone else's code, I tell you what. Sometimes, if that code is well written, which is where style is important. Okay, so compile time, we've just talked about that. Uh, DCC is pretty good at telling you what's gone wrong. It will tell you the line number as well where it thinks it's gone wrong. Um, so you kind of have a way to, you know, be able to look at, you know, where it's telling you something may have gone wrong and you can go there and try and fix it or you can focus your attention on a particular item. Um, and then runtime issues. Those are the ones that are the hardest to pick. Um, they are your logic bugs, and there's a few ways to do it. Um, one of those is that you can use external tracing. I'll show you how to do that in a second. It's not, um, I am big on external tracing, um, big on sitting down with a piece of paper and a pen and tracing through the code. So I actually give the values to the code. Um, the other way you can do it is you can pop a few printf statements in random places in your code so that you can see what values your um, variables take. Um, which is also a good way to do it um, because it allows you to see at any point in time, especially in while loops, okay, using printf statements and while loops is quite handy because you can see um, you can see what values there are in the while loop and then you usually place one outside the while loop to see what it's exited out of the while loop with what value as well. So it allows you to really see um, whether your while loop has worked as required and what it has done. Uh, it looks like I've buffered again, so please refresh again. Um, just keeping you on your toes, making sure no one falls asleep with the constant refreshing. Okay, uh, let me show you how to do an example of tracing, okay? Okay, so when I do tracing, and I'm just using a piece of code from um, week four that we did with highest number, I basically go through the code and I have a little stack for myself. Um, again, these are memory addresses that I've just completely made up, but they are increasing up in, in fours, which means that I'm not doing anything except for ints. Um, but anyway, okay, so what happens is that I will try and fill up and I'll cross out and change my things as I go through it. So for example, I've got my first line of code. I go in here and it says int numbers, um, five, so I'm creating an array of five elements, um, and that array is all filled with zeros. Okay, so in that case, I did not mean to do an arrow, not sure why that's set to an arrow, sorry. Let me go back to a normal, I'll cross that out. So I've got one, two, three, four, and five. And then I'll go inside my int i is equal to zero. So this is going to be my i. i is going to go into the next one and it's equal to zero. Okay, then I'll go into my while loop. And I usually write what my while loop is asking. So my i is currently equal to zero, which means that my while loop is asking me, is zero less than five? And I'm going to say yes. So I'm going to go inside the while loop. I'm going to scan in a number and I'm going to increase my i. So then I'll cross that out and I'll go to my one and so on and so forth, okay? And I'll keep increasing it. So then I'll go again, is one less than five? Um, and yes, it is. So I'll go back in here and then I'll increase my i again. So then I'll go back out to here and I'll keep going until it's, it's less than five. So it will stop. At, and usually you don't, you know, just do that. But when it gets to four, and I'll say it's four less than five. Yes, it is. So then my i is going to increase again. It's going to go to the value of five. And that's when I'm not going to enter my while loop anymore. Okay. And when I stop entering the while loop, my 
I go on to the next uh, section um, and oh no it's uh, it's commented out it should not be commented out sorry line 28 should not be com commented out so then I've got this uh, highest number is equal to highest so I'm calling um, a function highest and function calls go in here as well so I've kind of I've called my function highest and I've given it uh, my array okay so I've given it my array and once I give it an array, uh, I'll move on to the next. Uh, I'll move into my function and I'll say highest number is equal to minus one. Okay, that's gonna go in here. Um, again, int i is equal to zero. And remember, it's a different i. So it will go in here and that is now equal to zero. And then I'll start filling it up again. And so what it allows you to do when you're doing this desk checking, I guess, is another term for it, but it's hand tracing, hand execution, is you're literally sitting down with a piece of paper and going through your code and changing the numbers as you move through the loop. So you are manually executing your code, okay? And actually, manually executing your code is very good for your understanding of what each code is doing. And it's it becomes very easy to find your mistakes as well. Um, you know, any sort of conditional loops here would be very easy to find once I start um, filling it out with numbers and then I can see exactly perhaps I increase by one too much um, and then I will go back you know down to four and so on and so forth so basically uh, this is one way to do it and the other way would be to put printf statements everywhere so perhaps I've got please enter a number in here and then in my line of code here I would have another printf statement that would print out the number that was just put in okay and I might have another printf statement after my i++ to say what the i is right now. And, and then after my while loop over here, I might have another printf statement to say what the i is again, to show me what the i is when I exited out of my while loop. So all of those provide me with some very useful information as well. Okay, And uh, that can be very useful to understanding your code and also to getting a hang of what the computer is doing each time it runs it your code as well so yeah um, and also you know uh, it's it's just a good way to debug sometimes uh, obviously not for huge chunks of code this is not a great way to do debugging for huge chunks of code you will go insane but it's a good way to do it for some of your lab exercises and so on and so forth okay um, let's have a look let's have a look at a piece of code that we're going to debug now okay let's do that all right so this piece of code is one that we wrote last week um, and it is uh, one that finds uh, the smallest or the largest in a to it um, but also i've riddled it riddled it with bugs so let's try and run it and then we will see potential ways that we can debug it as well. So let's have a look. All right. Um, oh, and if Shrey has fixed the live code, so you can feel free to open up this debug.c because it will, um, you'll be able to see it's much easier to do it when we see the piece of code. All right. So I told you that I've riddled it with bugs and, and, Look at that beautiful DCC. DCC is yelling at me. It is not interested in what I'm doing because it thinks I'm crazy. There's a lot of errors. When you see something like this that looks like absolutely a dog's breakfast, okay, what you want to do is you want to be able to go to the first error that you see, okay, and fix the first error and then try compiling it again, okay? So fix the first error and try compiling it again because often... When you fix the first error, a few other errors down the line will go as well, especially when you've got a missing bracket or when you've got a missing um, hyphen or so, you know, a missing semicolon that sends a whole flow on effect of errors. So always fix the first thing. So the first thing it's telling us is that there is an invalid uh, double use of an equal sign. Um, did I mean equal sign? I mean, it's even telling us how to fix it. Amazing. So I've used a comparison equal sign when I really need to have an assignment here. And it's also telling us where it has occurred. So line 23, 
Uh, I go to line 23. If you've ever wondered what that 11 is, it means character 11. So if you count 11 spaces, you'll see that it's uh, your equal sign. So that should be one equal sign, not two equal signs, okay? So I'll save it again and I'll run it again. So underneath each error, you will get a DCC message. Okay, so now I've got a whole bunch of things going on again. It's still feeling very any. Um, I'll go back up to the top error and I've got, oh no, uh, no, ah, no. This is what happens. I start losing code. Let me clear the screen and then run it again. Okay, I'll clear. And then I'll run it again and let's see what the next bug is. So GCC doesn't find as many errors. DCC um, gives you a lot more details on what the errors are. And GCC is just another compiler. Okay, so let's have a look at our next error. Looks like I have a few more comparison errors. And it looks like there's more errors than before. Okay, here we go. Warning, format specifies type char star, but the argument has type int star. Okay, so what have I done here? I've scanned f at percent %c, but I've got a command in here. So that's happening on line 32. So if we go to line 32, So let's go to line 32. Here you can see on line 31, I've declared a variable int. And then what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to scan an into a variable int. I'm trying to scan in a char. So that's clearly not going to work because my types need to match. So I need to change it to a decimal number in order for it to be able to work. Okay, let's see anything else. And let's see if you guys can pick the next... Um, the next issue. So I'll clear this again and I'll run it again. And I'll go back up. Okay, here we go. Uh, ah, it's moving out. Okay, who can tell me what this error might be over here? Warning, using the result of an assignment as a condition without parentheses. It's nice when it's telling you my internet connection's unstable, isn't it? It's fun. So what do you guys reckon that could be? What do we reckon? If we're looking at this, tell me what lines I can fix things on. Can you see anything else that I can fix in this debug.c? Yep, so I need, yep, so here on line 34, I'm trying to assign something when in fact I need to compare. So I need a double sign, okay? And similarly on line 36, it's the same thing. I need a double equal sign as well, okay? That's great. Can anyone see any other problems? Okay. So a few people are saying the comparison is chars though. So we should have the command type as char and scan in char. Yes, very good. Well done. Okay. Well done. Good pickup. So instead of doing this int command, because I'm comparing it to a char, I should really have a char here and I might scan it into a char as well. Okay, so that should work now. Maybe, we hope it should work now. I'm not sure I understand. Oh, now my Siri is working as well. Oh my gosh. Siri wants to debug code as well. How exciting. 
Except she's not sure she understands. That's not good. We want her to understand. Okay, can anyone see any problems? Should we compile again? Let's compile again. Okay. Still more errors, but getting less. What's warning implicit declaration of function highest is invalid. What do we reckon that one means? Yeah. Faisal, yeah, there's definitely too many brackets. I've got an erroneous bracket somewhere. And I think it might be, this one could be an erroneous bracket. Looks like here there's also some extra brackets. Yep. Yep, line 40. Excellent. Well done. The array isn't initialized. Yep. Okay. Excellent. So let's initialize the array. Okay, what else what else do you think is the problem? What do you think this this error message here means? Implicit declaration of function highest is invalid. What do we think that one means? Yes, well done, Catherine. I did not prototype any of those functions. So I've got to prototype both of these functions. Okay, so that's what that error means when it's saying, I don't know what this function is. It means that you haven't prototyped it. Okay, so always one thing to look, to look for because this one happens very often when you forget to prototype. Okay, we're getting closer to it compiling, which doesn't really solve anything. Someone, I think, picked up a logic error as well, so that's good, because the logic error is the one that's going to make it also not work as we wanted to. So let's have a look. No, we're not compiling yet. Did I save it? I did save it. Okay. So we're not compiling yet. Let's see what's going on here. Okay. No, that looks like an old error. Hold on. Let me clear it. It does get very messy once you start looking on the terminal. So let's clear it and then let's run it again. <coughs> okay, still things happening. So let's try and go to the top section and see what else might be going wrong. Okay, what do we think this error means? So I've prototyped my function int highest int numbers. What's that telling my function? What will be the input into the function? No, not quite. So right now I'm giving it this int numbers. What does that mean I'm giving my function? And what should I actually be giving my function? So right now I'm giving it one int called numbers. But in fact I'm giving it, yes, well done Catherine, I'm giving it an array. And I haven't told it that I'm giving it an array, which is a bit rude. So I need to give it an array. And similarly here, I need to tell it that an array is coming, okay? And that means up here as well, or down here, it's, it's going to have an array. That's right, yeah. So it was only an integer, now it's an array. So now it knows that an array is coming. Well done. Let's clear it again and let's ru run it again. Oh, and this time it's compiled perfectly. All right. Well, let's see if we can run it and it's going to give us a highest or a lowest number. Okay, please enter a number. 
One, two, three. I'm good at my numbers. Uh, I always enter one, two, three, four, five. Okay, what's happening here? I've entered some numbers. Would you like to find the smallest of these or the largest? Let's go smallest. Oh, what's happened here? And I think someone further up has picked it too. I think Seb picked it. Yes, well done, Seb. While loop should be less than. So he picked the logic error before we even saw it. So as you saw, we compiled, but there was an error in our logic. And again, this is a very common type of error where we... Uh, our while loop is now going past the last element of an array because remember if there's if the size of the array is 10 um, then we don't have anything at the index 10 we only have something at index 9 because arrays start indexing at 0 so we can't have this equals here because there's no such thing as something at array index 10 so let's save it and let's try running it again so well done Picked uh, both the syntax and um, the logic error. Okay, and now let's do the smallest number again to see if it works. And it's told me the smallest number is zero. Oh, what's happened there? Why do you think that's happening? So clearly that's also an error in our logic because we don't even have the number zero in our case. So who can tell me what is perhaps happening here? What do you guys reckon? Where do you think this mistake is happening? What's probably happening in our smallest function? Yeah. So I could be printing something wrong. What am I printing here? I'm printing smallest and then I'm giving it my array. So I'm printing based off the return of this function. And what's the function returning? It's returning smallest number. And now what's my smallest number going to be? So if I'm sending it my array, I'm making smallest number numbers at zero. So it looks like here, I'm actually giving it a zero. So the way that you could see, what am I actually giving it to start with, is you can straight away here put a printf statement, okay? Once we put the printf statement here, you can see what it's giving it and you can see where it's gone. So this is called debugging statement, okay? And the purpose of this statement is really just for yourself to see what's going on, okay? So if I save that, I really should have made this a much smaller array size. And I forgot to give it, so look at that, I've even introduced an error without meaning to. Uh, so I want to see what smallest number is. Um, and so someone's saying scanf numbers i... where are we scanning in the numbers? Yes, well... <coughs> well done. Someone's picked it without the printf statement. Well done. So look at how we're scanning into our array. We're scanning into numbers, um, which doesn't quite make sense. We need to scan into numbers at index i, okay? So the array, because we've initialized it all to zero, everything is zero, and it's like we haven't scanned anything into the array. So when you put these types of printf statements, they might allow you to see, actually, you're setting in zero over here. So something is wrong with the array. Where do I actually do stuff in the array? I do in the array over here. So that means that I will go up here and I will see if I'm actually doing things correctly, scanning into the array. And there were two mistakes here. First of all, I was missing the ampersand. So that means I'm not putting it into the address of anything. And second of all, I was missing what index I'm putting it into. 
So that was causing my array to not fill up nicely. And, and you could have picked that from going around um, and getting to it once you realize what the mistakes are. Okay, so let's try running it again. Let me clear the screen and run it again. And yep, well done. So now if I put my 10 numbers in and then I choose the smallest, it will give me one as I wanted it to. So well done on finding uh, all the possible mistakes. And let's check it for the largest number as well. And if you were to do your own testing, you would test a few things, not just the smallest number and the largest number. You would test putting it in the middle. You would test putting it on the outsides. You would test putting it at, you know, somewhere just around. Um, just to see that it works in all different circumstances. So that's uh, really uh, kind of a crash course in debugging. There is a lot more to it. Um, I tell you what, um, because when you go out and you do programming for a job, you spend uh, most of your time really debugging and finding errors and trying to solve the problem. So there's a lot more to it, but these are just some uh, little things that you can use to help you debug your code. And especially as you um, you know, start working your assignment one. Assignment one has a lot more lines of code. So feel free to use, you know, some of these strategies to allow yourself to see what's actually happening in your code. Um, but well done. Well done on finding the logic errors and the syntax errors. That's fantastic. Okay, let's have a look at our next... Okay, so let's do a few more helpful functions that we that are available to us. Okay, um, so I'm going to introduce two more functions today that you can borrow and have uh, to use, and they are getchar and putchar. Okay, so getchar over here, it's a function that reads reads in a single character from input. Okay, it reads in a single character at a time. Okay. So one thing at a time. So it reads one byte of input and it usually returns an int because remember the ASCII code of that character that it read is an int. It can also return minus one, which is an end of file. And that's useful for knowing when you can finish your input. We've kind of talked briefly last week about an end of file. Um, so you can keep getting characters until an end of file has been reached. Um, and again, you do that with the keyword EOF. Um, which is a hash defined. So you don't need to worry about what it's actually returning. Um, you just use the keyword end of file. Um, and it will not get its input until enter is pressed at the end of the line. So let's say I've entered in my name, Sasha. It's not going to read them one character at a time until I press enter, then it will start reading them one character at a time. So let me demonstrate that for you so you can see what on earth getchar is doing. Let me swap screens to my VLAB. Okay, and I'm going to go to my getchar demo. Um, and I might do it in a while loop as well to demonstrate the end of file at the same time so that you guys can see how it, you know, all comes together, I guess. Okay, so um, I've kind of put a lot of comments in this code to try and uh, set you up on your way. So you've got your int character. Um, so I've got a variable int called character. I can use, uh, well, I can also have a char, um, char character that I'm reading into. It depends what I'm doing. Um, so again, let's start with int, then we can, then we can fix it to something else so that you can see how that works. Okay. Now I want to read a character. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to assign to my variable character the output of whatever happens in this getchar situation. Now, if you notice, getchar doesn't really need an input um, because it's just taking one character at a time from that standard input, so from your terminal. Now, I want to read the characters from the terminal until an end of file has been reached, okay? And that's a very good question, Keanu, you've got there. What's the difference between scanf and getchar? You're about to ask me the same on putchar and printf. Um, scanf is a formatted scan, okay? So that means that you have to specify 
what format you're reading, what data type you're reading. Am I reading an int? Am I reading a char? Am I reading a long float? When I do get char, I'm literally taking off one character at a time, okay? So it's a really fast way to read one character at a time. So if we do this, I'll do this as a char, okay? And that, and that will make it easier to understand. Okay, so it takes one byte, which is what a character is. A character is one byte. Um, so, okay, let's do a while loop. So whilst my character is not equal to end of file, and if you remember, an end of file is when you press Control and D together, that signals an end of file. So I want to keep taking characters until someone presses Control D. So that's what I've said. Until that character is equal to end of file, I'm going to keep doing something in here. The reason I've got a character here, so I took the first character, is so that I have something to enter this while loop with, okay? If I didn't have this line here on line 13, that means I wouldn't be able to get in um, and actually have anything to compare in the while loop in my condition. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use some printf statements and really it's uh, demonstrating how we can use printf statements to see how something is working. So I'm going to say you did the character um, and then I want to echo the character that was read in, okay? Um, now, I'm going to use a printf statement until we go to the next slide when I teach you a simple way to put out a character as well. So I'm going to printf a character and I might put a new line so we can see what's going on. And I'm going to do a character. Okay, now, since I'm reading my characters over and over again, okay, until I reach the end of file, what I want to do is I want to get the next character. So I'm going to say character is equal to, and then I'm going to use the get char again to pick up the next character in the buffer, okay? Um, and then that is it. So if I were to run it so that it can demonstrate how it actually does it. Okay, so I'll clear the screen and I'll compile. And then I'll run it. <clears throat> Okay, I didn't have a I didn't have a prompt to enter something. Okay, so it's just gone to my actual um, you know it's waiting for me to enter something. So if I put in my name, what you can see it does, and I pressed enter afterwards. Okay, it has gone back to me by S A S H A. Becky, excellent question. What do I mean by buffer? I'm about to explain it. Um, so I'm going to go S A S H A. And then it's got a character here as well, because if you remember, I pressed enter, okay? And, and enter is a character in itself. It's in the ASCII table. So it's read my enter as well. Okay, so the way get char works, and Becky, you've asked what the buffer is. This is what the buffer is. The way get char works is until I press enter, things go into a little buffer, okay? When I press enter, then it starts reading from that buffer. So that's what I've done. I've entered Sasha, I pressed enter, and then it starts reading them a character at a time from that buffer. And now it's waiting for my next input. So um, let's say I've done that, and then it will spit it out at me here as well. Um, and remember, all of these things are characters as well, even the exclamation mark. So every time I press enter, it's going to give me that as a character as well. So to stop it, I'll press Control D, and then it will just exit out of it because that means that I've said, okay, I've got an end of file, I've reached this end of file, okay, and that means stop. I don't want to do anything else. I'm done. And so it's exited out of the program. So what GetChar does is it picks up a character at a time, which is really useful to be able to, in certain cases, and we will see those cases as we go on, okay? Now, there is this other thing called a put char, okay? Now, a put char, so we've got our get char, get character, and a put char is a put character, okay? So, what that means is instead of doing this printf, percent %c, um, you know, new line, character, what I can do instead is I can literally say 
put char and then I want to put out a character. And put char works in exactly the same way as this printf that's printing out one character. And again, printf is a formatted print, okay? What that means is you need to specify a type um, and you need to kind of really format it. Um, and a put char is just a really easy way to put out one character, okay? It, it, you can use whichever way makes more sense to you. Um, but uh, put chart is available to you if you want to put out one character onto the terminal, okay? So let's have a look what that does. So if I compile it again and I run it and I enter something in uh, and so, okay, this is looking pretty bad because I, I don't have any new lines anymore. So I'm going to control D, okay, to finish it. And then I'm going to go in here. And what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to print F a new line so we can see what's going on. But you can see that it's going to do exactly the same thing um, as the as the print F one character. Okay, so let me enter. Okay, so it's doing exactly the same what we're doing, okay? Um, blah, 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 and so on and so forth until you press end of file, okay? So there's two ways for you to do it. Someone's talking about strings. Strings are coming. So close. We're so close to strings. They are tomorrow. Um, so strings are definitely coming very soon. We're going to talk about strings tomorrow, which will be another neat way for you to do things. And you'll see you'll really see why we want to use that uh, get char because it's going to make it really easier. So Aditha, get char is when you get a character from terminal. So that's when I'm actually reading this in. And put char is when I put a character out to terminal. So one is output and one is input. So get char, I'm inputting and put char, I'm outputting. So I'm outputting this character onto, um, onto the terminal. So I... Uh, Put char is basically a printf and get char is basically a scanf, but they're just one character at a time. Okay, so there are also a number of different, um, so that's those two functions, which are quite neat, I think. Um, and now I'm going to show you a whole bunch more that are also quite fun. Okay, and someone's asked if, it, if it's an int character, how does it accept a char? Um, so remember that uh, a character is actually uh, an int. So um, because it's it's coming from the ASCII value of the character. And someone said, can we not print the last line? So you don't want to print the new line. There are ways to swallow up the new line. Don't you worry. So someone wants to swallow up the new line. The way you can swallow up the new line as well is uh, you can just use a get char and not store it in anything and then throw out the new line. Um, <coughs> so we'll, we'll have a look at that in a second, okay? I'm just going to show you I've got a little slide of why we would use one over the other. Um, so basically, scanf is a formatted way of reading input from a terminal. Get char just reads a single character at a time. Okay, so for scanf, we have to specify what is the format. Get char just reads one single character, um, and scanf takes in the format. It takes in the variable address as well. Okay, whereas um, you know, get char does not take any input at all. Okay, so. Basically, it's it depends what you're trying to do, how you will use them. But usually, get char is a much easier way to scan in a character at a time. So, yep. So someone's asked. Alvin's answered the question as well for you. So you can say if character is equal to new line, then you will you know not do anything, um, and then that means you've swallowed that new character. Um, but there are also depending depending what you're doing. There's many ways to swallow it out, but you can just not. Uh, you know, not put it into a variable with an if statement. Um, and someone said, why do you need the get character, character is equal to get char after the printf percent c character? Okay, 
Um, the reason you need that is because you need to keep getting characters in the while loop because otherwise you've just taken in one character outside of the while loop. That means you will only read the first character if it's placed outside the while loop. So what I mean by that is what you get if I don't have this in here, if I don't pick up the next character, then it will finish up quite quickly. So if I run it now, and I enter in again something, um, what I've got is an infinite loop because I always have the same thing stored in there, my first letter, um, so the character never changes. Okay, so what I've created is an infinite loop um, and um, it's just recurring infinitely here, which is super fun and who remembers how I can stop it? I'm just going to stop it before I crash my computer. How about that? Um, so control C if you have an infinite loop and you need to stop it. I think we've had enough uh, tech issues for me to not crash the computer um, today as well. So what happens if I haven't taken the next character is inside this variable is always the first character, which is S. So it says, is S equal to end of file? No, I'm going to print it out and then I'm going to print a new line and then I'm going to go again. But inside that variable is still S. So I've gone, okay, is S equal to end of file? No, it's not. So I'll keep going and going and going. So I really need to pick up the next character um, in order to not uh, basically crash everything uh, in a blaze of glory. I do enjoy a good blaze of glory, but possibly I think we've had enough tech issues in the last two hours. Okay, so there is uh, a bunch of other kind of cool functions that are available to you. Oh, I love that everyone does know control C. That's excellent. Okay, so there's another bunch of awesome functions available to you. We've done some of these functions ourselves, so we've actually written the code for them, but they're available to you. You can really use them. So inside this C type dot H, okay, which is another C standard library, and I've put a link here where you can find all the functions that are in this uh, standard library, but these are probably the most useful ones here. So is alpha and you put a character in here, it will determine um, if the character is a letter. Is digit will determine if the character is a number. So it makes your comparisons much easier. Is lower determines if it's a character is a lowercase letter. Is upper determines if it's an uppercase letter. To lower, it changes something to a lower character case letter. And to upper, it will convert the character to an uppercase letter. So um, there is a lot of... Uh, quite exciting, well exciting, very useful functions here that you can use um, and maybe let's see a few of them being used. Okay, so Bob's just asked, doesn't understand how character get character prints out the next character. Okay, I'll, I'll quickly show you, okay, before I do the next lot of characters. Okay, so let's say this character I've typed in here so before this happens, I've typed in Sasha in here. Yeah. So if you remember, I said that get chart picks up one character at a time. Okay. What that means is the character that it picks up on the first go is going to be the S. Okay. In my buffer, I have S A S H A but it will only pick them out one character at a time. And I have a new line in there as well. That's sitting inside the buffer, okay? Now we will pick up this S and it will go down here into the while loop and it will say, is S equal, not equal to end of file? It's not, so I'm gonna enter this while loop and then I'm gonna go through it. So this is never going to get another character because I'm, I've am i already gone past this line, okay? And remember in C, we do our code consecutively, okay? So if it's going to just keep moving around this while loop because there's nothing to stop this while loop because there's nothing to change, update my control variable. And in this case, my control variable is this character. Okay. All right. So let's, let's use a few of these functions. I'll go to this piece of code here. Um, so I've got this lovely, uh, I'm going to swap this to a chart to make it easier to understand. 
Okay, printf, enter your name as an example of getcha and press enter. And now let's let's do a few little things here. Let's use a few of those lovely functions that I've just talked about. Okay, so first of all, I said that the character stuff is located inside the library called C-Type, okay? So it's really important if you're going to use any of them to include this library called ctype.h. So this is a library that contains a lot of the character functions. Okay, so I'm going to enter it in and then I'm going to do something here. So I've, I've used my while character is not equal to end of file. I'm going to print if you entered the character. So I'm going to echo the character now and then I'm going to print the new line. So exactly what we were doing. Now I want to check if the character is a lowercase letter by using the function is lower found in C type library. Okay, so already I've included my C type, so now I can just check. So I'm going to use this is lower function and the input to it is the character that I'm checking. So these functions check a character at a time. Okay, so if is lower character, so if it is a lower character letter, then I might want to convert it. So if it is, then convert it to an uppercase letter. So if it is, I'm going to convert it. So my character is now going to be, I'm going to convert it to an uppercase letter. So two upper, and I'm going to tell it what I want to convert. So two upper character. Okay, and then I can print it out. So printf, your new character is, and I strongly recommend you kind of, uh, hang out and play around with some of these characters. I'm going to use put char again. And then I'm going to print out a new line again. Okay, so now I've done that. And then I want to get the next character from the buffer, okay? And I do that by inside my while loop saying character is equal to get char. So I'm loading in the next, the next thing. So I'm taking up the next character and putting it inside the variable character. Okay, so let's see what it does now. So if I save that, Okay, so I've done some magic here. Um, character variable is used uninitialized when you call the function. Okay, so that's the mistake that I was telling you about before. I've just done it. So I've got this character here, but what's happened is when I go down to here, I've got nothing to compare it to. Okay, which means that I need to take in a first character before I enter the while loop because I need to know what my first comparison is going to be. So I'm going to pick up the first character before the while loop and it will avoid this mistake um, that we see here. Okay, so now I'll run it. Okay, and I'm going to put in my name. And so you can see um, my first thing is Sasha. So the first one is S. Okay, and what's happened here? It, uh, it was an uppercase letter. It wasn't a lowercase letter, so I didn't do anything. When I entered a lowercase letter, it changed it to an uppercase. When I entered a lowercase, it changed it to an uppercase. Lowercase, I entered, changed it to uppercase and so on and so forth. Okay, So that means what's happened is just a quick example of how to use these functions. And we will see a lot more about it um, as we go on as well. And I will try and use a few of those when we code because it makes your coding a lot easier because all of those are already done for you, okay? And I've included this piece of code on the slides as well. Um, so um, you are able to access it at your leisure and play around a little bit with it. Um, yeah, and is lower returns true or false, basically. Um, so it's, it asks a question and returns whether it's a lower or an uppercase letter. Okay, um, we're going to finish there for today. I'm so sorry for all the technical issues that we saw today. Uh, that was a bit of a, um, yeah, not pretty. So I've put in an application to return to campus to lecture because clearly it's not working. Uh, my internet is not really working well and I'm just waiting for approval. 
um, and hopefully that will mean that we have no more uh, technical issues. So I'll finish there for today. Thank you so much for uh, your patience in getting everything set up. That was really nice. Um, and, you know, thanks for tuning in to listen about, you know, practice our pointers, learn a few more new things. Um, tomorrow we're going to talk about strings and command line arguments. So a few more exciting things before the flex week break. Uh, finally, you get a little bit of relief. So I hope you all have a wonderful uh, rest of the day. And I'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Um, see you later. Bye.